She is joining us from the Big Island tonight to present A Tale of Two Continents, which explores the mushrooming traditions of Southwest China and South Central Africa. Her interest in mushrooms blossomed when she joined the MSSF. She eventually became a newsletter editor and the speaker chair. Um, so great example of somebody stepping up and volunteering and finding a spot. Um, everybody's welcome. Uh, Wendy has traveled the world with David Aurora on a fascinating quest that embraces both mycology and anthropology. She's an amazing cook, always experimenting, and has a soft spot for mushrooms that are not well liked by the mushroom-loving masses. Uh, and I think Mike is saying that he would love the, to know the secret of cooking porcini tubes, um, but maybe that's a whole different program. Um, welcome, Wendy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, I can start with the uh, what Mike's request was about the porcini tubes. We call it porcini, like uni, like the um, sea urchin. So porcini, play on words, uh, because when you steam the porcini tubes, when you cut it really thin slice and then steam it for just about 15 seconds or so, it puffs up. And then it shrinks when you turn off the stove and then it tastes all the umami flavor of the mushroom is, is right in there. So it tastes uh, like, like a vegetarian uni and it's really good either over rice or you can like have little sushi things with like a long piece of steamed porcini tubes on it with a little salt and butter. It's really delicious. So do try it. A, a lot of times I think people pick the mushrooms and then they throw out the tubes or they cut the stems off. But because sometimes they're hard to find, it's really good to be able to use the, the mushroom in its entirety. And then you can explore and taste different flavors. And what you often find for those of you who've been hunting mushrooms for a long time is when you find bowl eats in the forest, some of the times all the tubes are missing because the squirrels and other types of animals, they chew up all of them. And because that's the most flavorful part, kind of like the liver for fish or shark, I guess. <laughs> and then, or they lay it out to dry and then they use it later. So that's a really, really packed flavor in the, in the tubes. You can also uh, dehydrate it and powder it. And, and if you had porcini salts, most of it is probably from the tubes and all the flavors there. So we'll start with that before my talk. It's really nice to see everyone on the screen. I think we've no, a lot of people I know, others I don't, but it's really nice to see the faces, especially post uh, COVID and not being able to travel. And when I was reviewing my materials for the talk, I just want to say really miss traveling. And I did have a chance to go traveling, and that's why I'm in I'm in uh, Hawaii right now. But before Hawaii, I actually made it to Japan. And when we we're talking about morels, we actually found morels with some people in Japan, um, these people that we met, they are, they call themselves wild ingredients providers um, instead of commercial hunters. I just thought it was like a very different attitude towards thinking about, you know, our culture and what we think about mushroom hunting and commercial mushroom hunters here um, versus other countries, mushroom loving countries like Japan. They're like wild ingredients foragers or they're like, providers of wild ingredients to restaurants and hotels is it just sounds a little bit like nicer <laughs> and more noble in the things that they do so yeah it was just I'll just start with that and let me and thank you to Maria for logging in early to help me with zoom because I have a new computer and it's not working very well so let's see if I can share this with you can you see my screen Yes. Cool, cool. Okay, and I'll make this a little bit bigger. And I can't do um, I can't do a preview because when I do preview, everything is paused. So excuse me for just having this on the full screen. Okay, so it's a mushroom of two continents, but I figured I forgot to count the U.S., so I add that as a third. <laughs> and here's a picture of me in Japan. So this is a very recent picture. Uh, I'm that person. <laughs> and you can see there's uh, some cherry blossoms. What was interesting in Japan was the was um, these morels. They're probably the Morchella escalenta group, and they grow with uh, cherry trees, and there's cherry blossom blooms. They also grow with ginkgo, and they grow with cedar, like different types grow with cedar as well. So it's very interesting forest there. 
Okay, first off, um, I'm going to focus my talk on California, Yunnan, and Zambia. So what do we know about these different places? So California, of course, is a state. Yunnan is a province in China, and Zambia is an entire country. And if you look at the relative size, California and Yunnan are about the same. Um, Zambia is about doubled in the size. What's interesting, if you look at the number, the percent forested in California, Yunnan, and Zambia, the contrast there having maybe Yunnan a little bit more forested, California only being about 33% but 60% of that is publicly owned and 40% of that is privately owned. In terms of like the place, the elevation, there are um, ranges as well. In California, we have the Death Valley and then high mountains. And then in Yunnan, they have plateaus as well as, you know, more or less like uh, 250 above sea level. For season wise, um, they all have rain, but Yunnan and Zambia, has monsoon season, which means they rain in the summertime. And then we have Mediterranean climate, which rains more in the winter and fall. And then in terms of diversity, let me just move this over because I can't see. In terms of diversity um, in plants, in California, we have about 500, or sorry, 5,000 native plants plus 1,500 naturalized. And in, in Yunnan, um, half of the plant diversity is actually in Yunnan, of which 30,000 is in China. And then in Zambia is half and half, there are 3,500 native and 3,500 naturalized. In terms of population, Yunnan has 7 million more people than California, and, and Zambia is just a mere 17 people with a lot more land. But if you look at the GDP, uh, California has 3.1 trillion, which uh, Zambia has a very small fraction of it, and, and Yunnan has like roughly 10% of that. And fun facts, of course, we know in California um, is the birthplace of Google. Yunnan has the birthplace of tea. And then um, Zambia is very popular in terms of uh, their Victoria Falls. It doubles the height of Niagara Falls, and it's also wider. Um, and then California, we have the largest trees in the world. Yunnan, we, there's 350 species of rhododendron. And then in Zambia, there's the big five for wildlife viewing. So just general overview of how we're similar and different. I just added a um, bonus slide here because there's a lot of discussion um, in Mushroom Facebook forum about foraging in general and is California like overforaged and I just wanted to show like let's look at Czech Republic and Poland like well after after now that we can travel those are two places that I would love to visit because there are many many people who forage um in Czech Republic is documented that 90 percent of the population um forages and then in Poland 50 to 90 percent and their percent forested country is similar to California and then um so I don't know how many people actually forages out of the 40 million in California, but I feel like there's gonna, there's a lot more places that we could open up for foraging and still be sustainable. And then of interest, uh, one, one more slide that I added here is, is about carbon emissions. And um, in the uh, United States, um, carbon emissions is about 14.2 per capita, and then Zambia is 0.4, and then China is 7.4. So just sort of like think about uh, 7.4 is Yunnan specific. It's not like no, no. It's, it's whole is all of China. Thank you. I got like a note reminder right behind me here. <laughs> okay, so my focus of the talk today is to um, think about how you can tell if you're in a mushroom loveland culture or not. And it's organized into three different areas. Uh, one is in, in the country that you're visiting, how accessible there is, is, is there to mushroom hunting? And then what is the diversity of mushrooms being collected? And then what is the availability of mushrooms sold in markets and restaurants? And that um, is what I'm hypothesizing that if, there is access, diversity, and availability of different kinds of mushroom and access to mushroom hunting. 
that would point you to um, a country that is more mushroom loving and not mushroom fearing. And there are, um, and then in my talk, there are six things to watch out for, to watch for that differ from mushroom hunting here. So in in contrast, um, what we what I saw in travelings in my travels with David is that mushrooms are picked whole generally and not cut. And this is always true in Yunnan and mostly true in Zambia. Uh, there are no mushroom brushes. I think there's this lack of material of, of brushes and then to just collect it as part of food. And then mushroom knives are rarely used. So here's an example of a picture that mushrooms are picked whole and they're just kind of brushed off with the hand and getting the, 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 the big debris off. But it's usually as a whole, there's a feeling that if you pick the mushroom as a whole with a little bit of dirt in it, it means it's, it's fresh and it's also from the forest. And then number two is mostly that the common names are used and not the scientific names. We haven't encountered um, an avid mushroom hunter out where we're hunting that knew the scientific name of any mushrooms. They have multiple names for, for different like chanterelles is a big broad category in Africa, for example, for many kinds of chanterelles, they don't have different scientific names for that. I think is important for science as this is a paper um, from European Journal of Agriculture, but you can see the names, the local names is all either Pretandol or Pretandue, but there are different species of um, cantharellus. Number three, kids help in all phrases of mushroom collecting. They like to collect, they clean them, and they also participate in cooking them. There's not this um, fear of, you know, kids touching the wrong mushrooms or getting poisoned or ingesting every, something wrong in their mouth. They're part of the process. They're part of participation in the whole process of hunting, cleaning, and preparation. And then... The fourth thing we found is that very few people have their own car and people like to carpool to go mushroom hunting together. And it's because they live closer to the forest is a much more, I would say greener activity than we would typically do in California where we have, there are limited land for legal mushroom hunting. So many a times we fill out a car with gas and then drive three, four, sometimes six, seven hours to go to good mushroom hunting habitat. But for them, is mainly um, carpooling with a, with a lot of, with, with people to different places, or they would just hunt for different kinds of mushrooms in their, I would say, like backyard or for a long walk. And then five, uh, mushrooms are routinely soaked and washed, and there's no aversions to boiling them. So as you can see on the left here, their mushrooms are just being soaked in water, so there's no dirt before it's prepared and cooked in the kitchen. And then on the right here, you see an example of a mushroom hot pot where they are just boiling the mushrooms and eating them and then drinking the broth afterwards. And lastly, um, all sorts of different containers are used to carry mushrooms, um, including uh, and this woman on the left who's holding a termite mushroom and he, she's uh, have a washing basin of lactarious mushrooms on her head. And then they use uh, baskets and plastic bags, everything that they could use. There's no, you know, only use one container. They use multiple containers and whatever they, they have at their disposal. Okay, gonna pause here before we go into China. Any questions of the six things I had shared or anything for now? I'd like to take a pause to see what the pulse is and what the audience want to hear more about. Alan. Um, yeah, so you mentioned that in some in societies that are less uh, micro, microphobic than we are, you know, children are out there, um, whole entire culture, 90% of the culture is eating, eating mushrooms or foraging. What do we what do we know about poisoning rates and anything like that uh, amongst those those uh, uh, countries or locations? Good question. I don't have those statistics. Um, I don't so don't know if they how often they collected as well as you know we collected. So there maybe could be, but we haven't like heard firsthand anyone, any kids that who have been like poisoned. Not sure about pets, but like kid wise, I think they 
usually learn from their grandmother and elderly and like villagers. We we found them tend to only stick with mushrooms that they know for that village. So if there's mm-hmm. anything that's outside of the village that they're not familiar with that is edible, they would not um, eat those. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other burning questions? Oh, sorry. It's it's. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's warm in in Hawaii. You seem to be good. Okay. Let's talk about Yunnan then. Where is Yunnan? Here's a map of China, and Yunnan is the uh, southern tip, southwest tip, near is neighboring Burma, Vietnam, Laos, and also Tibet. So that's that's where Yunnan is. So they have um, plateaus, they have the rainforest, and um, it's a, it's a really good center for different diversity and different mushrooms. So that that is the place that they're one of the um, most diverse mushrooms in the world are found there. And I think they eat documented eat over 200 kinds of different mushrooms. So now I will share some pictures of China. And we talked about access. So in contrast, this is a forest service sign that we see, I'm sure some of you seen quite often, no mushroom picking. Here's another sign that says private property, mushroom pickers keep the FK out uh, because we're not welcome there and trespassing their property or picking mushrooms is in contrast to some um, other countries where mushrooms and berries are allowed to pick anywhere in the country. And here's another sign, please do not pick the mushrooms because this area is controlled by naturalists. Uh, I don't, I, I, I would consider myself a naturalist and a mushroom picker, so I don't know what that means. Here's a sign from China. This is um, the brief introduction of the site of Man Qi Xiao Tang. And um, just, there's Chinese there and then there's English there. And I, I'm gonna blow up the English part here so maybe you can read better. So the brief introduction includes um, how big the area is, what's the altitude, and then what are the important tree species there are. And then it also talks about the common mushroom species, which includes Tricholoma matsutake, Boletus edulis, Cantharella salvarius, Sarcanum asbratum, Abrachellus elysii, uh, Amanita hemigalba, et cetera. So there is, it, it, and so on after Guamphus flacosis. And then it talks about the soil, the color of the soil, what's the pH of the soil, and the average annual yield of wild mushroom of 510 kilograms, of which Tricholoma masutaki is 250 kilogram, another mushroom is about 260. Can you imagine walking to Salt Point or some park that gives you an introduction of all these different mushrooms and how much is harvested and just the appreciation of welcoming you to like, hey, look, this is all the things that you can find. So it was a very different attitude. So the in terms of access, this, this picture is taken behind a village. As you can see, behind a village here, there's like some rice terraces and there's pine trees and, and the villagers just go out around these different areas and look for mushrooms. Here's another arrow shot of the different villages and farms around built around forested areas where mushrooms grow. Here's a man walking around with a mushroom in plastic bags that he has foraged. Here's a woman, very simply bucket, umbrella, plastic wrapped around as a raincoat to look for mushrooms around her village. Um, here's another woman. So the stick that she's carrying, she you, we use as well for um, fuel for her kitchen. And then uh, mushrooms in buckets as well as plastic bags. Yeah, grandparents and kids uh, hunting the best that's the um, scaly chanterelles that they do pick and eat. Here's a man with a flebopus. And here's some city people going to the farmlands to hunt for mushrooms. As you can see they're city people because they're very clean. Here, uh, some, some people uh, carpooling together in one motorcycle collecting rusula. And here is me, David and I, we were, we were in these uh, like three wheelers that were taken, um, we were taken to villages to hunt mushrooms with them together. 
And here is a uh, contrast, um, uh, a ranger, a policeman looking at the masutake mushrooms, making sure that they're weighed right and collected properly. And here I am in China with the police taking me to go mushroom hunting. <laughs> Very different attitude. So this is we we met um, we met the uh, the university student who's behind me. She was interested in mushroom hunting, and her father is a policeman, and he wanted to escort us together to go mushroom hunting. So I've never mushroom hunted in a police car before. So we're driven to places to mushroom hunt, and after the mushroom hunt, we cooked some of the mushrooms, or the policeman did, and then uh, treated us to lunch. So what you're seeing here is a really interesting scene. It's like a seven course lunch, which all of us are eating. And then behind us, there's a lot of action going on. This is their equivalent of their DMV, where people are taking their driver's tests behind us and getting their driver's license while we're having lunch. So it's very different. Um, here's a um, family sorting and cleaning mushrooms that they found. And here are the kids participating, not just in mushrooms, but also they uh, eat wasp larvae. So you see this little kid here just using these um, forceps to pick out larvae from, from the nest. And I didn't see them get stung or anything. They, they, they seem to be really experienced with it. Murder hornets. Uh, yeah, I guess we call them murder hornet, hornets here, but they, they eat them there. Okay. Then um, next, I want to show you some pictures of diversity, the different mushrooms that they pick. Can you see that okay? Yeah, here's a, um, a couple picking different diversity of rusula around their village. And here um, you can see they they love the um, corals as well. They call them uh, sopaching, which means like broom mushrooms. And she's got uh, some butter butter bolete looking like things, and then also other boletes in there. Here are um, some uh, very popular green rusula that they eat, and then um, another rusula on the top there, and then a bolete down there on the bottom. This was in the market and they just lay them out on ferns and you can pick and choose what you want to buy. The, this is a basket of all edible mushrooms and there's some amanitias in there as well as corals. And yeah, what, what you'll notice is that when the villagers go out, they pick mushroom, they pick a variety of different mushrooms and they sort, sort them when they get home. Different kinds right here. in all different ages, the grandma picking uh, bracken fern as well as mushrooms to take home. They usually pick them to um, eat themselves. Can I say something about this? Sure. Okay. I have guess. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that this is actually from that little reserve that has the welcoming sign where they have matsutake and they have uh, there's a porcini and various other valuable mushrooms, but it's hard to find those there. And these villagers seem perfectly happy with gathering sewillus and rusula and making them into delicious food. And I think that attitude here is lacking. It's all about fear of missing out and jealousy that somebody else got, got a certain kind that you want instead of just utilizing what's available. Thanks. Yeah. Here's a um, Amanita's hive. It's really beautiful. And here's some Lingji in the market that this lady got. And I think these are earth balls that they also collect and eat and sold commercially. Squirrel derma. Squirrel derma. And here are some different types. Uh, it looks like man on horseback, very similar to ours, and then some um, lactarius. I think these are butter bolites that they have there in China. And here's some red staining um, bolites that they eat. I know for us, um, 
our general rule of thumb is not to eat any red staining ones, but they have red staining ones there and they eat them as well. Red poor, red poor ones, yeah. And, and these two are um, popular commercial mushrooms that they sell in markets. The left one is called Gambajin, which is a telephora and is valued for their um, fragrance and smell. So what they like to do is like to put these in the hot sauce. Uh, so it helped generate the smell with the, with the spiciness together. So that's very popular for that. And the one on the right is the version, um, the Chinese version of the termite mushroom, which is very sweet. And they usually steam that with a little bit of lard. Just different diversity of mushrooms here. And then showing the washing and soaking of mushrooms. You can see here, they mixed Rusula, Lactarius, and Boli together, soaking and washing them. And I think then I'll have some market shots for you. Then we can move on to um, Africa. Just blow this up a little bit. So here is the typical um, restaurant scene uh, where they uh, have mushroom restaurants. And in front of the mushroom restaurant, they have a big poster on the kinds of mushrooms that they have and then how they cook it. And then this is also being cooked in a grill. They use charcoal grill and they grill the mushrooms there and you can eat, just eat outside. Here, um, you'll see that they pick the mushrooms with the dirt on them. And then on top of the dirt, they throw in pine needles as well. And they believe, you know, having the mushrooms in its natural state keeps them uh, fresh longer. So they put pine needles and then uh, fern leaves to cushion and also um, help with the uh, maintain the freshness of the mushroom. And here they use the pine needles to use it to grill um, tofu to get the, some pine flavor and then use the pine needles to grill mushrooms to get the mushroom pine flavor in there for the, for the um, lactarius. And this is really cool. I wish someone would start this in the US or in California, maybe San Francisco was trendy. They put all of the fresh ingredients um, outside, all chopped up and cleaned in the refrigerator. So when you walk into the restaurant, you can just point to what you like and um, fresh ingredients and they'll just cook it based on what they have that day fresh. You can see there are different mushrooms in there and they have like squash and asparagus and um, some pumpkin greens. So you can have chef's choice or you can just point what you like and then they'll make it for you. Here's um, a lady cleaning mushrooms at a restaurant, washing mushrooms in the restaurant. And here's a typical um, Yunnan dish. What they like to do with their mushrooms, uh, it's really with pepper, garlic, and chili. So any mushrooms, it's like we like to uh, use butter and garlic. A lot of times when we cook mushrooms, they like to use pepper, garlic, and chili. It's uh, their favorite way of stir frying their mushrooms. And here you see uh, different color of pepper and garlic and chili with different mushrooms. Here's another one. Sometimes they'll throw in green onion. Lacaria. This is lacaria. This was a really good dish. Lacaria is edible and they pick it and sell it in the market too. And here are uh, some um, Lactarius, white bleeding lactarius. You can see delicious pepper, garlic, and chili. Those are good flavors for mushroom. And here's um, a uh, bamboo mushrooms, or uh, I guess we call them sinkhorns, but they're really valued for their stalk, their um, stem. Because if you, I know a lot of people like morels. And what I discovered, like cooking morels is very interesting, right? Because it has all these crevices that are, um, capturing all of the different flavors and the things that you're cooking. Similarly, um, the sting corn uh, also have the ability to do that. So it absorbs a lot of different flavors that you like in the mushroom and it gives it an extra texture. And so this is like a very flavorful chicken broth with um, some of this mushroom and it's really delicious. It's really light and dainty and delicious. Here's the mushroom hot pot. We can throw in different kinds of mushrooms in there and have it together and shared. And some stink corn into the hot pot. And here's a stir fry butter bolete with garlic chili. 
and just a vast amounts of mushrooms in the mushroom markets are pretty incredible. Here's uh, a mount, mountain full of uh, swillis. Um, and they export this to Japan because Japan really likes this mushroom. They call it hamataki in Japan and it's a little bit tart and they like to use that with fish or make pickles out of it. Here are some um, edible amanitas that this person is selling. And here's a typical kind of mushroom market that everyone has a little bit of mushroom that they sell and make extra money. And um, you can just pick and buy a mushroom and you see that none of the mushrooms are cut. Another market shot and um, they lay everything on, on firm. <laughs> And here's the telephora and also some um, murder hornets, chanterelles, and um, lingji, Ganoderma. Some popular bolides. They don't sell, they export a lot of the bolides edulas, but the, the local folks like to eat these kinds, this yellow, this kind of yellow like morel, I'm sorry, yellow like bolide. This is like a market with lots of different bullies here. You can see there's red ones, yellow ones, and brown ones, and red ones. More. It's like a giant mushroom fair going to Yunnan. Highly recommend going there if you really love and want to try different mushrooms. Most of the time, we're not foraging there. We're foraging in the markets because it's hard to find all the different kinds. But walking around yourself, you just go to the markets and there's like hundreds of different kinds of mushrooms being sold. He, and um, this is a restaurant where we actually uh, brought our own mushrooms from the market and gave it to the owner and she cooked some dishes for us. Butter bullets. Yeah. And here's a mushroom restaurant menu there with different kinds of mushrooms and the cost of each portion. And then uh, you pick your portion and then ask them how, you know, how you're, however you like them to make it, but it's usually chili garlic. Washing of mushrooms before it's dried and exported. Here's some green russula that's really popular. Yeah, the market shots. And here's some tremella. This is cultivated tremella. And here's some cultivated mushrooms that we got from Berkeley Bowl, all from China. Here's some stink horn. So this stink horn doesn't stink. So it's a non-stink horn. And um, how they prepare it is that they take off the top and then they just keep the, 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 the veil and then also the stock dried and then used and sold. The telephora with a really wonderful smell. And then here are some chanterelles that looks diff really different than ours. And this is... Um, the tiger's paw. What's the scientific yeah. name? Alicia. Scudiger Alicia. Oh, Scudiger Alicia. And we have a Scudiger in um, Mendocino as well. That is really tasty. This is a very tasty mushroom with really intense flavor that tastes a lot like um, chicken, actually. Not chicken of the woods, but this is Alicia. we we'll call it goat's foot. It turns green. Here's some matsutake number ones. Termite mushrooms. Lots of termite mushroom. And you will notice that when you're in the market, it's really interesting that they spent a lot of time putting them in really nice displays. So when you're shopping, you know, when we shop in our grocery store, everything is all displayed really nice. A similar concept, they display the mushroom really nicely. So you could uh, have a really good look at the product or buy the whole basket. Here's some sorting of the mushroom and selling of the little mushrooms. They trans, there's not a lot of cars, so they tend to transport them in bicycles. Here's a man, I think he's um, just selling little things that he found sorted. Yeah. And here's a big termite mushroom. Yeah, lots of market shots. Red russulas, lots and lots of bolides. It's endless. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think like, this is a pile of butter bullets. Yeah. And what you're seeing here is that um, they're 
they're working. They're um, cleaning the mushrooms. First, they scrape off the dirt and then they um, dunk them in water and clean them really good. Then they slice them up and dry them. And this is what the finished product looked like. It's really pristine, but it's a lot of manual labor. But you see all that like dry porcini, uh, dry butter bolides are being, being sold in the wholesale markets. Here are some red pork bolides that they eat. Rubo bolides. And um, the, uh, here are some hygrophorus, um, corals, and I think like these are like areas, yeah. Yep. And a floor full of rusulas. Yeah, we 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 don't we we don't eat a lot of corals here, but I really like them. I like to make jerky out of them, and so they they sell them as um as coral mushroom that they just cook with garlic and chili. Yeah, different people, different mushroom. Yeah. That was squirrel derma, more like, I think. Oh, here's more um, dry porcinis probably going to uh, Europe or US. Sorting of the porcini, dry porcini. And um, this is another restaurant shot. Uh, and instead of putting this behind the refrigerator, in the refrigerator, they're putting it outside so you can you can uh, pick and choose your, your vegetables and your mushrooms. And I, I was really fascinated with this giant bamboo shoot right there. Yeah. More restaurant shots. So yeah, we would love to go eat there. Catathalasma. That's a that's a catathalasma, like imperial cat. So I think if you're hunting for masataki, sometimes you find this one instead is is very delicious. More bolites. Um, yeah, more market shots. I think that's the last one. I know I, I feel like I'm reliving going to the markets with you. Okay. Now we pause for questions. And time for you to get a little rub down. Thank you. Thank you. There are a few questions in the chat, if you can see that. Okay. Let me see. Thank you, Natalie. You're welcome. I am not very good at using um, Zoom. How did you know to go to this particular province? Um, well, I, uh, I think I was, David invited me and he said, you want to go to Yunnan? And I said, sure. And he's been there plenty of times. And then I think how he got there, uh, maybe I'll let him tell the story. How, how did you know to go to Yunnan, David? Well, way back then, I think it was around 1990, I didn't know to go there, but I was in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And we saw this a little sign that said, cheap Yunnan tours, you know, five days for I think $200, including airfare. So my friend who is an anthropologist and me got on the plane, went to Yunnan and were there right in the mushroom season during July. And we were blown away. I mean, it was unbelievable. So I started going back every summer after that for you know, maybe a couple of decades. And I got lucky just to tag along. And um, question from Christine on um, wanting to know how those people in Yunnan are able to differentiate mushrooms. If they do, if they consult any knowledge or info sources on what kind of education do they receive on it's just passed down. I think it's basically passed down um, village local knowledge. I don't think they particularly go to school for mushrooms. No, it's just passed around and you can go to the markets and actually ask them questions. Uh, um, an earlier question concerned poisonings, and China definitely does have them, but I I think a lot of it's uh, um, resulting out of changing conditions, you know. The people that, that move to cities or come back and don't know mushrooms as well. 
And also, if they're selling all the mushrooms, that's led to them uh, trying to eat mushrooms that they didn't used to eat, and that could get them into trouble too, especially with a deadly poisonous brucell on there. And we have Mariana who raised her hand. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have so many questions. Um, the first one is, what are the seasons? Are, like, are there mushrooms, like, are mushrooms available all year round and just different kinds of different times? Um, another question is, do you guys have any idea, like, on the statistics of, like, how much, much mushrooms are foraged versus um, farmed, and which one was your favorite, and um, what do you know about the poisonous mushrooms that do exist out there? So that's a lot. <laughs> okay, let's try to address them one at a time. I have like an expert here to help me. <laughs> in turn, I can tell you what my favorite ones are. Like, I really love the termite mushroom because it's not something that we have here. And they're like really sweet and crunchy. So I really like that. And then also love the, the tiger paw mushroom, the scutiger elysiae. So I highly encourage you, or maybe I should keep this as a secret. If you can find them in Mendocino and you don't know how to cook them, call me and then we can share it and then we have a cookout together. Um, in when, when, are, when are we going? When are we going? <laughs> You can gather them actually in the, the Sierras. There's actually two kinds, a coastal one and a mountain one. <laughs> and in terms of the mushroom season, the mushroom season peak in July because the monsoon season is where the rain is and the diversity is at peak at that time. I don't know if they get mushrooms all year round. June to September is the main Okay. June to September is the main season. And then do we know if um, there's a difference in in uh, forage versus cultivated mushroom percentages? Well, Yunnan, I think during the mushroom season, there's a high percentage of wild mushrooms consumed since they're only available seasonally. And then after that, it would mostly be, be cultivated mushrooms or dried wild ones too. But in most of China, with a huge population, and mushrooms are an important part of the diet, I would say through most of the country, they're eating cultivated mushrooms. Yeah. Did you miss one? Did you have another? What do you know about the poisonous mushrooms that are out there? Yeah, I think they have poisonous amanitas out there. And then um, sometimes they sometimes people in the village just pick them and then they try to sell everything. So the person buying, it's up to the owners of the person buying to know which ones are deadly poisonous and which ones are not. So they'll sell, they'll sell stuff that people would buy. So that's a watch out. I think if you don't know the mushrooms there to like buy with someone you know, or buy, you know, there, there has been, um, we've heard, um, people who don't know mushrooms and buying mushrooms that are that they got sick from. Well, I had a, a, I noticed a seller selling an amanita that I had never seen for sale there. And it was a, a lepidella, which not all of them necessarily, but many of them are toxic. So I, I said, uh, is this edible? No, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and he said, uh, I don't know. I said, Do you do it? <laughs> no. Is it edible? I don't know. I said, Well, why are you selling it? And he said, Because somebody might buy it. So, <laughs> we're depending on the buyer. It's what is on the buyer. What they're doing is bringing the mushrooms to the market and letting you go mushroom hunting in the market and choose the ones you want. So, Super interesting. Super yeah. interesting. It is. I mean, um, listen, concerning the, the other two things, that almost all the deaths, there's a, a published article on mushroom poisoning over, I think it was either 10 or 20 years in Southwest China. It did not include Yunnan, but all the other, other provinces around it. And there were two mushrooms that were responsible for all, almost all the deaths. There's an Amanita there. I think called Amanita obsidialis. And then um, 
there's also erythroma, subnigral hands. In people, and this has caused a lot of confusion because people assume that Russo subnigral cans, if you scratch it, it'll turn black because Russo nigral cans does, but it doesn't turn black. It just turns reddish. So the closest thing that we have to it here in California is the Russo cantaricola that grows with oaks in association apparently with chanterelles. So that, that's the main two. Okay. When talking about Rusula, Daniel had a question about the red Rusula and a little bit about like curious about them because people don't pick them here since they're bitter. I believe the red Rusulas in China is a different species. And um, there is a interesting video that we found on, on YouTube that talked about different mushrooms and in, in, in China, which includes a red Rusula. That is very popular and command like a premium for them. Yeah, right. There is a red rusula, and then when you make soup with them, the whole broth turns red. It's like really popular. So um, maybe if I remember later, I can send you a link to that video. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is very nice. Okay. Any other questions about Yunnan, China, before we move to Zambia? I love questions because I feel like I'm not talking to myself or just talking to David. Cool. Okay. No other questions. Let's move on. All right. Where is Zambia? So Zambia, if you look at the content continent of um, Africa, it's right here in this region. And Zambia is um, in between the Congo, Botswana, Angola, and Malawi. In this area, they are. If you if you blew if we blew it up on the right hand side, all these dark gray area is the Miembo woodland, and Miembo is a Bemba word for brachystesia. And the mushrooms are uh, mycorrhizal with with the um, brachystesia species in the subtropical grassland area, and also. Um, Uapaka as well. So those are not not pine trees are like totally different and it's a different woodland there. Uh -huh. Okay, so now I go back to my Google Drive with pictures and show you pictures of Africa. So what does the access look like in Zambia? So this is a typical savanna um, Miembo woodlands, there's clearing of grasslands, and then within the trees, there are brachystesia and uapaca trees in here where you can find lots of mushrooms. And there's um, lots of rivers with crocodiles. And um, what you're seeing here are hills that are made from, from termites, and these hills are where termite mushrooms grow. And um, in their art, example of some of their folk art also have mushrooms in them. So villagers gathering, hunting mushrooms and have mushrooms and chant. These, these things here are chanterelles. And I think these, yeah, these are chanterelles that they're hunting and gathering. And these here are um, amanitas. And um, of note, uh, if you drive around Zambia, you'll notice a lot of this charcoal being sold. So a lot of the Brachystesia Nuapaka trees is being cut down because they have uh, rolling blackouts and unreliable electricity there. Uh, so the unfortunate part is all the trees are being cut down to few um, fire and cooking and that um, intrudes on the mushroom habitat as well, but you know, development. Here are um, some kids picking some black chanterelles here. Not black chanterelles and our black chanterelles, but these chanterelles are black color. Here is a, a woman. Um, they like to, women are really good at holding things on their head. And this is a woman with a wash basin collecting chanterelles. Here is a uh, mother and baby collecting their amanita. Zambianensis, and this is their local well-loved Amanita called the Tente. 
They're really delicious. Here's a family collecting some um, amanitas, tente, in their baskets. More tente, they grow really, really big. They have a big sack, they're really fluffy. They could be um, whitish or brownish. And here are their small version of termite mushroom. And this was actually growing in someone's house where uh, the termites um, are under the ground and then mushrooms are growing from their house. And they, this particular family looks forward to this event every year because these mushrooms are really good and they use them in, in, in stews and in the soups. And she's collecting them. So their houses are not made of wood. So it's not the same termite that would destroy houses here. So I had some people ask me a question about that. So here um, is a village. There's no electricity in this um, hut that they live in. So they use the sun to dry their mushrooms for later use. Okay. Let's look at diversity of mushrooms. This is another amanita that they eat called the lavosa. It's similar to our um, red blushing amanita that we have. And this is a popular one that they collect and eat. This is a friend Marjorie collecting a bucket full of them. And what's interesting is when she picked them, um, she snapped them off and not picked the whole thing. Here's a truffle that they pick and eat. Here is, uh, just want to show you the diversity of different mushrooms, a lot of uh, bolites here. They have different bolites. You see the orange kind and then also the green poor staining kind. As I understand, like some of these are, they have a lineage to the Boletus edulis, but they're much um, older in their lineage. Here's a, um, a boy with some red staining edible bolites. And um, here you see some really colorful bolites and also chanterelles. So let's see one point, there's no point really. Like these are all edible. And then there's some orange, yellow, and pink chanterelles. And then, uh, and then bolites that are red and also yellow. And this is a um, poisonous. <laughs> Amanita, if you don't detoxify it, this 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 is related or similar to Amanita muscaria, except these are very tiny, and um, these will give you a trip if you don't detoxify and eat them. Had firsthand experience with them; they're fluorescent pink, very, very powerful, very potent. This is all edible Amanitas. In the middle, the, this is the big Amanita that they love called Tente. And then there's also small amanitas all around this one, it's just a variation in sizes and color. It's interesting, the villagers call this tente, the middle big amanita, and then all the one on the sides, they just call them Husband. the husbands of tente. <laughs> Here is another amanita called akafita, and they said the kids love this one because it's bright yellow and it's easy to find and the kids like look for them. Here is an um, amanita called kumfungfi, and it's interesting because it has little spikes on it. Here is a large gray amanita that they believe has kind of like magical powers, and uh, they really enjoy this one too, but you have to like ask the shaman if you can eat this or something like that in the villages, but this is something that they, they really prized as well. Yeah, this pink amanita, uh, we read a book that said this one was edible or is eaten in some villages, and we thought they were small. We know that they look like the um, amanita muscaria type because they were so small, we didn't detoxify it, and it was really, really potent. And then uh, we lost a day um, tripping and uh, fell asleep for a really long time, but we're okay the next day we can get in that story when I'm not being recorded. Um, and this is, this. later we found out that this particular mushrooms, the villagers do eat it, but they go through a boiling process before they cooking. So just like the Amanita muscaria, 
and then the water that they say for like a pesticide for to spray on their vegetables. Here's a um, red poor bolit. Do we know the name of this one? Uh, doesn't have a name. Okay, so probably something that we don't. This unnamed. It's edible. It's edible unnamed species. Yeah. We call them rabbit sprint, right? Oh right, this one they call um, translated rabbit sprung. What is it called? I can't remember. Nakuma akalulu. Yeah. Set it up. I said it. Up. Yeah, and then this wow. one is the is the gray amanita that's really priced. There's a couple more amanitas that are big and beautiful, and this is the um, black staining lactarius that they eat. They really like lactarius and the amanitas there. And here's a carton of eggs, amanita eggs that are all edible, really beautiful. I especially like the bullet color ones on the bottom. Here are uh, showing you some diversity of chanterelles. So you can see all the chanterelles here. There's the yellow one with the almost scale-like structures. There's the orange ones. And then these tiny, tiny chanterelles that they, they sell in the market and also really hard to pick and find and clean. And then there's this kind of white one that barely have any gills at all. Then they have this chanterelle that is black on the underside. More than 50 species. Yeah. There are more than 50 species of chanterelles in that region. And they're all really flavorful, much more flavorful than the ones that we have. Very fruity. Here's another picture of the chanterelle diversity there. They're all growing there at the same time. Here, um, collect, collecting amanitas to eat from the villagers. Very strange ones. We call this one the peanut amanita because it, it crumbles in your hand like you're holding nuts and smells a little bit like peanuts. Okay, so that's the diversity. And then I have a special focus on the tente mushroom because they love this mushroom. So you can see that this mushroom here, it grows like, it's like an alien like dropped this egg on earth because it starts like this and then it kind of grows and then, and then the mushroom pops up from the top. It's not underground, it's on top of the ground. You can see here, it just starts on the top like this and then the things just grow. See how big they get? like a little dinosaur egg, ostrich egg, huge eggs. This is all Tente Amanita Zambiana pictures. There's me. And if you cut them open, the folds are really fine, like a book of a, like a, like a book, pages of a book. And so in China, they like garlic, chili, and pepper. In Zambia, they like to cook mushrooms, any kind of mushrooms with tomatoes and onions in the stew. And so we cook some with tomatoes and onions because that's mostly what they sell at the store. We did some roasting of the tente mushroom. It's delicious as well, something different than tomatoes and onions. Here's a couple of shy boys hiding behind the mushroom. And here's a special focus on chanterelles. So the chanterelles in Zambia likes to grow with this uapaca trees and uapaca makes these fruit that you can eat. They are called masuku. And they look like that. And you can make jam or you can just eat them like that. They're, they're sweet, kind of taste like jelly. And these are the chanterelle mushrooms that they grow with the masuku tree. You can see they're really beautiful. It kind of reminds me of the hygrophorus yeah. here because of the color, but this is a chanterelle. Really bright. Me and my friend Marjorie, we hunted together. And we're washing them, more people gathering chanterelles with buckets on their head. And um, what was interesting about 
as you know, they don't really have a lot of, they have street markets, but most of the time, because they're living in villages with uh, limited connections to city to city, a lot of the kids would sell them just on the highway. So they would be gathering of kids with their mushrooms and, uh, or they sell like gasoline and chicken or whatever, but but with mushrooms, they would just hold it and wave a mushroom or bowl, and then you just go there, and then they, it's kind of like a drive-through mushrooms. You can, you can, they swarm with to, towards your car, and you just pick your mushrooms and, and buy it. And I think one of those costs like two, three dollars. And we made some really delicious broth with different kinds of chanterelle. And we made an omelet with the tante egg. Two is the two egg omelet and then we try to incorporate whatever we can pick from from where we're staying to make a meal more chanterelle shots okay and here is a mix of mushrooms and others so this is a, a cabanza they call which is a lactarius that they like to eat and cabanza literally means um, in a field. So this type of mushroom likes to go and grow in a field. They call it just cabanza. And here um, they're selling this mushroom that we also get here in California called clavelina. clavelina. It's really delicious. Uh, we also have them here going with our local furs, conifers. And here she's uh, holding a tente and also on her head, a lot of cabanza mushrooms, the Lactarius cabanzas. We met this guy in a store. He swears eating this helped him with his diabetes. And, he, and they also sell split gills. So they make um, split gills with a peanut sauce. And they like the red amanita, or I'm sorry, red rusulas. And I think because the red rusulas are like, I am really bad rusula identifier, but this red rusula was really delicious. They call this moon, munya, mutanda. mutanda. Yeah. And um, here's uh, a little girl holding her little cook stove to cook her amanitas in. There she is. So how they cook uh, some of the amanita, they just fry the whole cap. More people collecting. We're invited to um, taste the different kinds of mushroom that they found one day, one, one day when we went out foraging. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like eight different kinds of amanita mushrooms. And there's a couple of kinds where they just kind of fried and grilled. And then there's a couple where they made into a stew with onions and tomato. And they grilled it with their little stove that they made, recycled stoves. And I believe this is also a lactarius, very wide spread gills. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for the termite mushrooms, they like to grill it and then make it into jerky. And Marge is showing me how to do that on their grills. And then the washing of the mushrooms that they wash really well, different kinds in the, in the market that they sell. And again, they, they, they like to put them in really nice piles when they're selling. Hey. And this is the last one of the termite mushrooms that I will show you. Here are the little termite mushrooms. What's her name? Mycocarpus. Mycocarpus. You can see they're really small, smaller than the snail yeah. shell. Yeah, very numerous. It takes a lot of time to pick. Here's the ones growing with like a aloe or something, okay. Growing in between cracks on the wall. Harvesting and cleaning, sorting. 
And then the soup. Here's a, a typical roadside seller with the mushrooms they got for the day that you can drive by and buy. Here's the difference in size between the big termite mushroom and the tiny termite mushroom. So they're both uh, termitomyces. Well, I would do that to them. Okay. Just to add a comment, I don't know of any other genus of mushrooms, plants, or animals with such a wide range of size mm. in the same genus. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody else does. But I, yeah. I, so I, if anyone knows the same their size differential for any genus, genus, let us know. That's how big the mushrooms are, these big termite mushrooms. And they have a tap root that goes all the way down where the termites are. See how long that is? Here's a button. And uh, because we don't, have a dehydrator growing all the time and these mushrooms can grow worms really quickly we have to dehydrate them fast so we just dry them in the car and i thought this picture was really interesting after i took it if you look at how the traffic is there when you're driving there are like cars coming at you from both sides and you're driving in the middle but then this car in the, in the middle where you're following and says we can't change the past but we can create the future So we would dry them and then uh, kind of roast them, dry them, and then be make jerky out of them and bring them back here to taste and share. Here's another button. Victoria. Yeah, this is a person drying them. This is how they preserve them and eat them for later. These mushrooms are so big that one of them will feed a family for a couple of days. So we have to preserve them from dry, um, drying, and we're trying to dry them over a fire. And uh, we also got help with people in a restaurant to help us dry some. We found some too. It's cool. There's different sizes. That was the special focus on termite and other mushrooms. Let's go back to what I wanted to share now. Hopefully this works is um, because the tente was such a special mushroom. They actually teach kids songs about them. And there's a popular Amanita tente song that they use in weddings that children learn at school. So I'm going to see if I can play this. And if it, there we go. Can you hear it? Okay. Tente o andina no cuide neca, tente cua ma yanjalu kira yava na ya yanjalu kira yava yava nandi, tente cua ma tente bane, tente cua ma tente bane, tente cua ma tente. So that song, especially the theme, is around like the mushroom. Like you're my special tente mushroom. I pick you for myself. There's nobody else for me. I keep you for myself. This is my patch. So I thought that's pretty pretty cool that they made a song that they use on the wedding for a mushroom dedicated song. I can't imagine having a mushroom song for someone's wedding here, but maybe someone can and invite me. I would love to hear the song. Okay, this next one, see if I can play the video to um, show how uh, Marjorie collects her chanterelles. Oh, and I, here, there is playing. Isso, 
she has this technique of throwing her mushrooms up and down and then catching them while the dirt falls through her fingers. It's a very difficult thing to do. So I definitely tried that technique of throwing the mushrooms up and down, but just mushroom just was flying in the air and they got dirt all over. Yeah. Okay. So just to recap, these are some of the major mushrooms we saw in Yunnan. I am giving you the common name and also the Chinese name if you're interested in like learning the names. And these are um, mushroom names in Zambia, the local name and also what they are. And just to summarize, how can you tell if you're in a mushroom loving culture? Is there access to mushroom hunting? Or is there diversity of mushroom collected? And then what are the availability of mushrooms in market restaurants or roadsides? And I will stop here to see. Ya. I'm checking to see if there's any hand raised. Mariana. I, I have lots of questions again. Okay. Um, so the first one is... Can you talk a little bit about the parallels between the habitats out there and the habitats out here? Obviously, there's parallels between the species that you see out there and here. So do they um, do they are they related to the same trees as they are here or similar trees? Um, another question is on the psychedelics, how do they compare to the ones that we know? Not that I know anything about that. Did you try to carry any mushrooms on your head? <laughs> and how did you get mushrooms through uh, customs? Just curious. Okay, good questions. Um, habitat uh, in the woodlands are super different. I mean, they do have some pine trees there that would grow, you know, similar, like, do they grow? Introduced pines. introduced pines have similar introduced mushrooms, but like the chanterelles that grow with uopaca trees, which I don't think we have here. And then the brachystesia legumes. and the climate legumes, it's also very different. So they have a special relationship. So the trees are really, really different. Um, for uh, psychedelics, there was uh, one psilocybin that we found um, next to some, I don't, I don't know, like thong, horse thong. Horse thong. And I think they're equally as powerful as the ones that we have in, in you know, not that I know. Um, and what well, you do know. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and then what was the third question? Did you try to carry the mushrooms on your head? Oh, failed badly. <laughs> they're really, really enthusiastic about mushrooms. We went to the market and bought the biggest termite mushroom that we want, that we wanted to take pictures of. But I was carrying it around through the market. These market ladies just came up to me and started ripping my mushroom because they were so excited about how it's showing me how to cook it and not waste it. So they're like ripping in the little pieces to show me that you can dry it. You can cook it with like tomatoes and onions. But I was like, oh my God, you're destroying the mushrooms that you're trying to take a picture of. <laughs> yeah. And how did and how did you get mushrooms through customs customs? Um, well, it's not a plant. And it's also, uh, <laughs> there's no dirt on it. That's a good one. It's not a plant. That's true. But did they buy it? I mean, did you, you know? Yeah. It's dried mushroom. Yeah. We removed the dirt and everything. So they don't care? No. Because I mean, they, they care about like cured meats, right? It's not a meat or a plant. So I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I've declared meat and got taken from us. Declared mushroom. They don't care. Good to know. Yeah. Cool. I think that was all your question. I'm trying to also. Yeah, you got it. Chat to see if there's any. Was it like China with buyer beware with knowing what you're buying? Yeah. From Lucy Greenway. Yes. Yeah. 
Not really the same way. Well, how would you describe it? Well, they still pick, they still buy only what they know, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a lot, a lot less uh, uh, diversity offered for sale than you know. Mm -hmm. In Yunnan, there's more than 400 documented edible species for sale. 400 compared to here, California, I don't know, maybe a dozen common ones. And in Africa, it's not nearly that high, but the diversity is lower too. And how did you know to visit Zambia for? Mushrooms, David. Well, I started in Zimbabwe many years ago. So how do you know that you Zimbabwe has mushrooms? Well, somebody invited me there. For mushrooms? Yeah. yeah. So word of mouth. <laughs> yeah, he was trying to export chanterelles to Europe. And so he wanted me to visit and give some advice. And I went to Zimbabwe many times, and then the whole situation there just deteriorated so badly, so it switched over to Zambia. Alan? Yeah, I'm curious. I think uh, you mentioned that there were 50 species of chanterelles. Was that correct? Is it six, yeah. 60? Yeah. More than, yeah. More than 50, yeah. There's, I'm wondering if there's any, like, so are there areas where there's a huge diversity of, in this case, chatrails and other parts of the world, another, like where diversity is stronger in certain areas than others and, and why might that be? I mean, I know it's an evolution thing, but I'm just wondering about that. Well, chanterelles are uh, evolved like bullies in tropical and subtropical areas. So there's always going to be more diversity in uh, Areas that have warm summer rains, like Eastern North America, has a, a lot of central diversity. So does Southeast Asia, and so does Sub-Saharan Africa. Whereas the areas with a cooler climate, like the West Coast, um, we definitely have chanterelles, but not that many kinds. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Kayla. Oh, hi, um, this is Kyla. I'm kind of new. Um, I live in San Francisco and just have been watching the Zooms and really appreciated um, you sharing about this. Um, I'm Chinese and it's like really great to see like foraging there. I was just curious about like sustainable harvests, like any behavior or guidelines that you observed um, with the groups that you went with, like if they had any yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like how they interacted um, as foragers or like best behavior, best guidelines and such. Sure. What was interesting, and I'm glad that you asked the question, is that um, in contrast to like being in like California and uh, in our culture versus the other culture, like they don't really talk about um, behavior or guidelines. They just sort of do their thing. And I think that is the only thing that I noticed that for me was really hard was uh, watching, you know, the forest being destroyed for, for fuel, for the, for um, trees being cut down. So then the habitat loss, but in terms of foraging, I mean, it's like picking fruits from a tree or not really the destroying the mycelium itself. So there's very little, um, you know, there's people are really relaxed about it. And uh, there isn't like do's and don'ts like we do here that's published in, in the books. And then also there's a lot more impact of people foraging as well together. So there's a common, I think, understanding of uh, not destroying the habitat. But as far as like taking the mushroom, cutting the mushroom, pulling the mushroom up, there's uh, there's no, no, um, harvesting guideline and is and is both sustainable as, as has been studied before pulling or cutting doesn't impact mushroom growth and then also thinning a forest actually encourages masataki growth in japan i would say the one guideline in yunnan that they have is if you're wanting to sell a mushroom you can't cut it 
they won't buy. Nobody will buy a cut mushroom. So they're always picked whole. And I saw that for, for their own use too. Yeah. Oh, hi, Wendy. Hi. I'm sorry to go a little off topic, but since you're on the big island, I'm just curious if you're seeing any mushrooms. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, really? I'm going to hold that to see if there's any other questions about Zambia or African mushrooms before I jump to Hawaii as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Any other ones? Uh, you can always follow up with me offline as well. Everyone should have my info in MSSF. If not, just ask Maria. <laughs> okay. This so we were there in February and, um, oh, there's this beautiful, I think it's the only U.S. cloud forest uh, about oh. 20 minutes up the hill from Kona. Gorgeous, but no mushrooms. <laughs> Um, last time we went to Kona, we saw um, the, well, David, I remember that drumstick mushroom with the four podaxes. We saw a whole bunch of podaxes growing in this dry area. Mm -hmm. And the podaxes, like inside the stock, there's like all this powder. We dumped all the powder and like put it in spaghetti sauce. So the sauce was like really dark and mushroomy. Uh -huh. And we had that for dinner. It was really good. Lewis. Oh, acknowledgments, of course. When and been to all these different places without getting to know David and uh being mushroom his travel, <laughs> and he has mushroom on his head. See, and then, oh. yeah, just want to thank Maria and Mike McCurdy, and of course, MSSF. And we finished QA recipe bonus idea. Here is a mush, here's this a four stem soup that I made yesterday, uh, from mushrooms in Hawaii. So we found. These four mushrooms here, there are four different kinds of stink horns that does not stink that bad. I mean, this, this one has a really pungent, deep, spicy smell here on the right. And this one here has like a, like a spermatic smell. And then this one here doesn't smell that much. This one here didn't smell that much either. So we made a soup with all four of these. And then how you, um, how you um, forage them is, to avoid the smell, you cut the top off because the stinkiest part is right here. So you just kind of decapitate the top and then you eat the stem, but not the very bottom where it's on the ground because it's also jelly-like. You don't want that either. So you just get this middle part, which is the best part and also the net. So we cut this part off, cut this part off, then cut this part off right here and then cut this part off right here. And then what you see here in this picture is those four different kinds. Look at how beautiful there. One is like kind of fluorescent orange. You have a yellow and a white one and then a pinkish one. So, um, and then we also got some tree ferns that someone was selling. So someone actually like, these are edible ferns, uh, tree ferns that you have to go through a process to render them edible. But after the process is done, people are selling them and it tastes like bamboo shoots. So we made it into a soup. As you can see here, we um, we got them washed and clean, chopped them up, and then the recipe is very easy. We took some um, chopped up chicken with some goji berries and some dry shrimp, fried them up till it's fragrant, then threw in the, um, the edible fern and then the uh, four different kinds of stink horn, and then added water, let it simmer for about 20 minutes, then added egg white, make an egg white drop soup, a little bit of salt and uh, voila, the soup was delicious. Yeah. So that's the bonus Amazing. recipe for anyone who wants to try. You can buy um, dried uh, stinkhorn mushrooms or uh, bamboo mushrooms in Chinese markets. And this is a perfect recipe for it. You can just rehydrate them and then use them in soups, but it's, it's very, very tasty, very good. Okay, I think that is my last slide. Questions on the recipe? Or anything else? Any curiosities? Because I know like you guys are tired. It's only 5.30 here. All righty. I'll turn it back to Natalie. Thank you very much, Wendy. And uh, thank you, David, for 
um, also participating. Um, this was super fascinating. I mean, I know there's mushrooms all over the world, but it's always good to see what's not in your backyard. And um, to me, it's really interesting the different um, cultural attitudes around foraging. I mean, the fact that you went foraging in a police car is just like rock star status to me. Like I wish the cops around here would be so cool um, and that we didn't need permits and that everybody foraged and it was just a normal thing and we could go wherever we wanted. And, you know, of course we can't, but sometimes we do. Um, yeah, no, I, I really liked um, seeing your experiences on those two continents along with what we do here in California. <clears throat> and your stinkhorn soup looks amazing. I've never had stinkhorn. I've heard that it's edible and I've heard that it's can be delicious, but I uh, appreciate the tip of cutting off the head and cutting off the root and going with the delicious middle. Well, everybody also asks, well, what does it taste like? And they're missing the point totally by asking that question because it isn't about taste. It, they don't really have much of a flavor. It's all about absorbing other flavors around them. But what's amazing about them is their texture. And that's what, that's the reason that they're eaten in China. We can add it to your culinary dinner on Monday. One of these thin corn soup. <laughs> and so, so what is the texture of a stink horn? Um, it's, uh, I think for me, like if you compare the chewiness of the morale and the flavor and whatever you cook it with, with the morale, it's kind of similar, but much softer. It's like a very soft, silky, silky version of that. Nice. My wife, my wife buys a lot of stink horns in Chinatown in Oakland and cooks a uh, chicken soup with them. Very good. How do you like it? How would you describe it? Uh, you know, she's so fussy. She picks every little thing. It's It's got a real nice, soft texture. Uh, to me, not a lot of flavor, but the texture is great. You know, and she she cooks for health. So it's, to me, it's very healthy. and Very and, nourishing. Uh, yeah, it's very yeah. nourishing. For sure. I think with the goji berry and everything else, I would love. Oh, yeah. We're growing goji berries in the backyard right now. So, yeah. She, yeah. It, yeah. I, I like it. She buys, she buys, I think, a big bag for like $15 or something. It's great. Yeah. I'll definitely commit to a culinary dinner dish the next time I go. Uh, what about eating uh, stink horns in the egg form? I've heard that people cook them and pickle them. Oh, I do that. All that? The, yeah. I do that. I actually we go Lake Merritt. We find a lot of them. Uh, I don't know which stink corn it is, but if we get them in the egg form and slice them, it looks almost like a snail when we slice them. But the flavor is kind of between bacon and a rich cheese. Yeah, the wow. clathus rubris, uh, the the uh, the cage cage stink corn is quite delicious. Yes, yes, that's the one. And, and do people also eat them um, when they're fully formed, when they're above ground? No, only in the egg stage. Okay, they have a stem. They don't have that stem. And oh, okay. Difficult to wash because the gooey stuff that stinks is on the inside. So and it's sticky. It's a lot of trouble. yeah. yeah. So I. I haven't tried the um, the one with the stem and the egg form, but I have seen pictures in the Ukrainian website that they sliced it and pickle it and use it in salad. I haven't tried that yet. I I have only tried the stem. Okay. Don't forget the one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's like a D list or maybe I can go to the MSSF Facebook group, but there's two links that I'll share. One is the one with the red Rusula video that was really interesting how people are harvesting and like cooking them. And uh, also in that same video, there's like a um, stinkhorn cultivation uh, documentary, a little bit of that. And you can see the stinkhorn growing and then being farmed and being cooked. And then the second link that I'll send is kind of like just a recipe for a, um, for a soup that was uh, had a really nice discussion about the texture and like how to make it. So I'll send, I'll send those, those over to the MSSF Facebook group. 
Very cool. Thank you. No worries. It was really fun and it's good to see everyone that I haven't seen in a long time. So you. Yeah, thank you so much.